Hello, Kidney Warriors! James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. I'd like to welcome everyone who's new. Hello out there! Go ahead and introduce yourself in the comments. We get new people every single time we do another show, and we have a very great, supportive, helpful, and positive community here at Dadvice TV that would love to meet you and, you know, get to know you. Now, let me help you get to know me. My name is James. I have kidney disease, and. I'm not afraid to tell people about it. As a matter of fact, I was diagnosed just over two years ago mm, with stage five kidney failure. Doctors told me it didn't look good, but they were wrong. I used diet, lifestyle changes. I started exercising. I worked with a renal dietitian, and that's the secret to better kidney health is working with a renal dietitian. And I improved my overall health, which lifted up my kidney health. Today, I am stage three, but more importantly, I do not have a single symptom. I'm living life and loving life. And actually speaking of that right now, I'm doing a promotion because tomorrow is a very special day for me. It's a day I wasn't sure I would see when I was diagnosed with kidney disease and be able to go outside and do stuff. You guys know what day that is? Tomorrow is the anniversary of my 29th birthday. I don't celebrate birthdays anymore. I stopped that a little bit earlier, but I keep celebrating the anniversary of my 29th. And in, because of that, I'm doing a promotion called Kidney Disease Can't Stop Me, the Share Your Victory Giveaway. And you can learn more about that on dadvicetv.com. All you got to do is take a picture of yourself loving life, doing something, spending time with your dog, spending time with your significant other, just sitting there, the great pose of the big smile, and post it to the Dadvice TV uh, Facebook page, and you may randomly win one of many, many prizes. I'm giving away Dadvice TV gear. We're giving away um, Pro Renal plus D, the renal multivitamin. We're giving away a three month supply of Renadil probiotic that me and our guest today, renal dietitian Jen Hernandez, both like for kidney patients. Um, did I mention some Flavus food products that are products made for kidney patients? We got all sorts of good stuff. But anyway, let's get to today's topic and to our guest. We are going to be talking about something kind of simple, milk, but it's something that with kidney patients, me included, we're a little bit worried about. Now here to talk about it, you guys know her, you guys love her, renal dietitian Jen Hernandez. Hey, Jen. Hey, James. Hey, everybody. Good to be back again Tuesday night, coming in live. As some of you have asked before, this is a live show. So I'm here with James tonight to talk with you guys about milk. Yeah. Now let those that don't know you, those that are new, know a little bit about you. Yeah. So for those of you that are new and have no idea who I am, my name is Jen. I'm a renal dietitian in the United States. I'm a registered dietitian that's also board certified in renal nutrition. And my focus at plantpoweredkidneys.com is to help give you information and support and ideas of how to follow a plant-based diet when it comes to your kidney health because I help people with keeping their kidney function and preventing or delaying the need for dialysis. So we do this with a big plant forward approach and I get a lot of questions that come across in my social media and in Instagram at plant.power.kidneys on Facebook in our free Facebook group, this private free community for people who are interested in learning more about this join and join this community that shares a ton of recipes and information and support. And then I get questions uh, via email, people asking all kinds of questions about different foods and what's okay and not okay. So I like to have these uh, talks here with James and then have articles that come out that also discuss a lot of the topics related to kidneys and nutrition. Yes, awesome. And we have so many people from all over. Hey, Lori, down there in Florida. I was just down there last March, right before all the lockdowns. And boy, 
Do, do my family and I miss Florida? We have even talked about retiring down there uh, just because the weather was great. But today, milk. Oh, my goodness. So many different kinds of milk, so much stuff to learn. Um, and I know many of you out there, like me, are worried about milk. And I was telling Jen just before the show, I actually have, for the most part, given up milk. I'll just occasionally have a little bit of almond milk, but I've kind of, I don't know why I got afraid of it right away when I learned that I had kidney issues and I've never taken the time to learn about it. And I've kind of been, I think, probably missing out. So let's find out about it. Uh, when it comes to milk and kidney disease, why are so many people like me afraid of it? Well, it a lot of times comes down to some of the big components of the renal diet, the things that we focus on day in and day out, two of which are phosphorus and potassium. So milk is higher in phosphorus. Some milks have organic phosphorus. Some milks have inorganic phosphorus, which is the kind that's added in as an ingredient. But either way, it can be quite high. So it is uh, something to be aware of when it comes to the different types of milk. Now, milk is uh, the organic phosphorus is still absorbed more than plants. It's in the closer into the 60 to 80 percent range that's actually absorbed into our body. So when somebody asks me, um, actually, I had a great question today on Instagram. Somebody was asking me about the milk, the phosphorus they saw in their milk. And they said, well, it doesn't include the percent, but it has the phosphate additive listed in the ingredients. Mm -hmm. And they said, how do I know how much that is? Well, the answer is, is we don't. We don't know. Companies don't measure that and they won't tell us um, basically because of the technology equipment and resource that resources that are required to determine that. It's just not worth it for them to do all that calculation and testing to tell us. All we really need to know, though, is if it's in the ingredient list, it's a phosphate additive and it's absorbed 100 percent. If it's not in the ingredient list, the milk absorption rate from cow's milk specifically is absorbed about 60 to 80 percent of the natural phosphorus that can be measured and is found in uh, cow's milk, for example. Yep, awesome. All right, it's, it's good to know that. Um, mm -hmm. Now, some of the things that I've been afraid of milk is something I had once and I hope to never, ever have again, kidney stones. Is there a connection with milk and kidney stones? Because mine actually were calcium stones that I passed, okay. or my okay. stone. Yeah, it was a big one so, that came out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I never ever wish that on anybody to go through that experience. Um, so there's a few things on the pro and the con side when it comes to milk for with kidney disease, or I'm sorry, with kidney stones. So on one hand, milk is a fluid, and we when we want to prevent kidney stones, one of the first things is to make sure you hydrate a lot. So any, any kind of fluid will count as part of that fluid goal. So on that side, it's great. The other side too is the calcium that comes from milk. Uh, it's important to get calcium, especially when it comes to the calcium stones, the calcium oxalate stones. The calcium helps bind with oxalates and decreases the risk of stones. But on the other hand, depending on the type of milk you have. If you have a milk that is, let's say almond milk or soy milk, almonds and soy are both high in oxalates. So that can increase your risk of kidney stones. So it really depends also, right. So it's kind of- this, I, I was waiting for you to this, say, oh, almond milk's better. I'll say, yay, I made a good choice. Well, some of the other ones that can be a better option are oat milk, which is super easy, super cheap. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying oat milk that you make at home, not anything that's cartoned and pre-made for you can get a, a bit more pricey, but also rice milk and coconut milk. Those are all good, more kidney stone friendly milk options. Okay. So what about gout? So there was a, a study that was done, or and I'm sorry, an article that collected research basically from 2015 that found that including some milk 
in the diet if you have gout has been shown to help lessen gout attacks. So it's focusing on the low fat and non-fat milk and even yogurts. And those helped reduce the serum level of uric acid that was found in the blood. So it's only a couple servings a week that they found benefits for this with preventing gout. Uh, so it's not something you need to down a lot of. And even the general recommended guidelines for dairy is only anywhere from like one to three servings a day. It doesn't need to be a lot. So with gout, they found benefits in just a few servings a week. So it can be helpful if you also have problems with gout. Um, but just keep in mind, it's not a more is better kind of situation when it comes to taking care of your gout. Awesome. Now, there are two types of milk. And when I used to live in Germany, there was it seemed like there was only one type. There was the kind we put on the shelf. It came in a little box and my mm -hmm. almond milk comes in that. And then there's the kind that comes in the, you know, you got to refrigerate, you know, the, yes. the traditional milk that we see here in the United States. Is there a difference between those two different types of milk just to start out with right there? I would say the biggest difference that I tend that I tend to find is that the shelf stable milks because they're shelf stable, which can be really, really good. And I do, um, I do think it's shelf stable can be part, a good part of a kidney friendly diet, especially when you are planning for an emergency. If you need to have emergency stores on hand, which is really important, the shelf stable milk can be a great option. But I will say you do need to comb the labels a bit more carefully than the refrigerated milks. Refrigerated milks, you still want to be careful of with the labels. But because they're shelf stable, many times they have more additives in them to keep them shelf stable. So either one can perfectly fit into a kidney friendly diet but you've got to make sure that you check those labels. So I do have some examples that we'll be diving into, but really the, the primary focus is going to be that label reading. That's, you have, you guys have to do that. I talk about this all the time. Label reading is so key to best managing and taking care of your kidney health. Really, really important. Yep. And are there certain milks? I mean, are they all equal when it comes to like potassium and phosphorus and calcium and all that, or do they vary between each other? Is that what the real difference is when yeah. it comes to a kidney patient? They actually can vary quite a bit. So even going from the different types of cow's milk, so cow's milk is is a classified based on the fat content. So a whole milk is, it has all the fat from just directly from the cow down to skim milk or non-fat milk that has the fat removed. So the different percent, 1%, 2%, those are all going to be um, how they classify. And there's some variations in those. There's a lot of variations in the plant milks, which I feel like every month <laughs> there's a new type of plant milk that's coming out. So oh. it's, it's just like anything that they can basically turn into a white liquid they class it it's, it's another milk so you know you can always just turn the corner and run into like you said it used to just be a couple options and now it's just more and more in options which is good but then it kind of makes it more confusing too yeah now if we look at just if you start with just cow's milk the common one mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i like the red label the full vitamin d that's what i mm -hmm. always wanted the other one's always seemed watered down to me and yeah. it's because there's less fat in them but I believe I've read that when there's less fat, the sugar content, actually the percentage of sugar goes up because they don't remove sugar. Is that correct? Or am I well, just? Uh, it's because it's a percent of what the milk is made from. You're taking a percent down from the fat content. Mm -hmm. So because there's less fat, it's going to be, it, it's going to be more of the natural sugar. So I do want to, I do really want to emphasize the sugar that's in cow's milk is lactose and it is a natural sugar. It is not added unless you're getting like a flavored, sweetened, you know, all those different kinds of the other milk options. But we're talking about just regular milk. When you, when people say milk, the first kind you think of, that's the kind we're talking about here. 
So I know that there is a table. Do you have that I, one? Yep, I have that James? one. Let me put you on the screen and I'm going to bring the table up here and drop it on here. And okay. There we go. There's a lot of information okay. here. Yes. So this is a summary of the different kinds of cow's milk. So you can see at the top we have whole, which is actually, I believe it's 3.75% fat. It's not actually, I mean, it's double technically the 2% more or less. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see the calories do drop down again because the fat, the calories from the fat are getting pulled out. So that fat content is a big drop. You see from eight grams per cup down to zero grams per cup. The protein stays the same across the different types of cow's milk. There is a slight increase in the potassium content, and that's quite high. So when people think about a uh, food that is high in potassium, yep. oftentimes we forget about what we're drinking. And this here is quite high. So if you're having a yeah. couple glasses of milk a day, that could easily become, especially if you're on dialysis and you have like 2000 milligrams is about where a potassium guideline would be for someone on dialysis. So a couple glasses of milk a day counts towards your fluid restriction and also is going up almost half of your potassium intake for the day. And yeah, that's and I'm not sure, even getting to anything else. Yeah. And I'm sure this is thinking this is for a cup of milk. Yep. You don't drink a cup. A, a glass is way more than a cup. <laughs> <laughs> Especially you, you reach that larger glass. If you have one of those for, for breakfast and maybe you have one for dinner. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, you could easily be half of your daily potassium allowance. Yeah. So if you are using cow's milk and let's say you use it for your cereal or if you use it for your oatmeal or something like that. Think of how that is adding in these nutrients. If you need to be careful, milk to me is one of the easier ones to pull back on in working to make a swap. So sometimes I've had clients work on just going from whole transitioning to skim and yep. they'll start kind of, they'll start doing a little like milk cocktail, so to say, where you do, you pour a little bit of the whole, of the whole milk and then a little bit of the skim milk into the same glass as you start to get used to less of the fat in your milk. And then once you're acclimated to the skim milk, then transitioning over to a plant-based milk feels a lot easier because you don't have that big transition going from the full fat milk. But I think this is pretty eye-opening to see how much potassium Ooh. and even phosphorus, even though phosphorus, again, it's not 100% absorbed coming from a regular milk, it's still upwards of 80% of this amount so it can add up and it's something to pay attention to if you have phosphorus issues or phosphorus control issues yep and it, it looks like it has a good amount of calcium and we always think of milk as being a good source for calcium mm -hmm. um what that what that shows me from what you said it looks like i made the right choice by picking a plant-based milk over traditional cow's milk mm -hmm. but what about the calcium if you know i always think of hey that's where i'm getting a lot of my calcium from where are some other sources that kidney patients can get their calcium when they do cut out regular milk like that yeah calcium is fa is actually found in quite a few plants uh it's not something that we typically think of just because the milk companies for so many years did such a good job about promoting calcium, like milk does the body good. All their marketing was just so yep. great and it really embedded into our brains, right? Like we associate milk with calcium because they really taught us that. But calcium rich plants do exist. Uh, James, I don't know if you have the picture, the other image that I have for the calcium plant plants. Let me try and see. Wait, I need to, it needs me to take a screenshot. Hold on one okay. second. Okay. I can get no this really quick. Okay. Um, Boom. Yeah, so no, wait, it's, yeah, keep talking. It's coming. Okay. Okay. I'll start talking about them and you'll have the picture come up. So one, uh, one of them, actually a group of them are the soy. Yep. There we go. The soy 
and tofu products. So soybeans, tofu, edamame, those are all in the soy family. Those are known as high calcium foods. So if you include these in your diet, you're going to be well on your way to getting calcium. And then we look at other things that we don't even typically think of like spinach, almonds, those have a lot of calcium in them. The winged beans, which I don't, I don't think I've ever had those before, but they look mm -mm. pretty cool to me. Um, collard greens, okra, and kale. So a lot of the green vegetables, um, though these are these are foods that still have the calcium that we need. Keep in mind, though, this picture here is focusing just on the calcium. We're not talking about phosphorus. We're not talking about even oxalates because some of these things, the tofu, almond, spinach. Those are high oxalate foods. So right here, we're just focusing in on the calcium. But there are absolutely sources that you can get from your diet that are plant-based that still have the calcium. And we haven't even talked about the other plant milks that also fortify with calcium. Yep. Now, before we get to the plant milks, being a country boy, there's another type of milk that's very popular, especially with cooking, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I love buttermilk how does that stack up so buttermilk first of all if you're not familiar with it if you don't know what buttermilk is it's actually traditionally a fermented milk that is how it is made uh in india and other cultures where they it's fermented so it has that's where that tang comes from if you've ever tasted buttermilk the traditional kind the typical kind that we now see in the grocery stores more often is uh, the milk that is basically the remains after a company has made butter. So in that case, it's the milk of butter, basically. So this is a really rich type of milk um, that is used in a ton of different cooking. And the potassium and phosphorus is pretty comparable to what the cow's this. milk is. Yep, there we Up go. There. So if we're looking down the line here for the calories, even the protein, oh, perfect. <laughs> so we can see compared to the other, the other table of cow's milk that the buttermilk options are still pretty close in line with the cow's milk, even the potassium and phosphorus. The calcium content's a little bit lower for the most part. Um, and by the way, I got all of this information from the USDA food database, which is a huge, like this is the go-to mm -hmm. site when you want to look up information for nutrition for almost anything, this is the place to go. Uh, so I have all the links available for this information. So, you know, I didn't just make this information up. I actually got it uh, from the database, but this is the comparison to show how buttermilk looks compared to cow's milk. Yeah, pretty similar. It's close enough that I would say they're pretty much even. Yeah, yeah. And one thing I will add is uh, buttermilk can be considered a kidney-friendly milk, but for those who've had a transplant or are immunocompromised, it might not be advised if it is the traditional buttermilk because of that fermentation process, including bacteria, which can be uh, harder for the body to basically fend off. So in some cases you'll want to be careful, but just check with your healthcare team if they're telling you to be aware of fermented products or even you talk about like probiotics uh, found in foods, like kind of along that line. If they're telling you to watch out for that stuff, then this is gonna fall into that watch out category. Yeah. Now does condensed milk fall into the category of like the regular milk and the buttermilk? Condensed milk. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Is it like sweetened condensed milk? Like, or is it just the, uh, I mean, even the unsweetened. So con the condensing process is basically getting rid of water from mm -hmm. the milk. So we have it in a can and uh, that is something that is going to be much higher in calories, kind of similar to the canned coconut milk. Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't know um, what the, I don't know what the nutritional values would be for canned condensed milk, but I can look it up as we're talking and see if I can pull it up. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, I have very little experience with condensed milk except making caramel. <laughs> oh just... yeah. That, yeah. Putting it in the slow cooker and yeah, having it in covering the water. it with yep. water, keeping it in there yeah. for a long time. 
You're getting a nice can. It, it's a, it's like a quarter of the cost of buying a little tub of caramel. Back yeah. in the day where everything I ate pretty much had that on it, if it was a vegetable or, or a fruit, you know, that was the only way mm -hmm. I used to eat apple slices. <laughs> caramel, pecans, <laughs> All that little kind chocolate. Of yes. <laughs> oh, it was awful. <laughs> Tasted great, but definitely not healthy. Yeah. I mean, the other thing with the condensed milk, unless you are, unless you're taking the condensed milk and you're adding water and basically reconstituting it to, according to the ratio, I think when you reconstitute it to the ratio, oh, I have a hair in my eye. Oh, okay. Oh. This is why it's live guys. Or this is how you know it's live when something like this happens. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so if you reconstitute it to go back to being in that regular milk, volume then nutritionally it should come out similar um but i'm trying to get the information and it's not loading right now of course um but well, if you're you using use, up like, all the, the bandwidth for the video and audio probably probably <laughs> but i'll i'll keep it i'll keep an eye and let you guys know what i find um but something like sweet and condensed milk you're using in a recipe and usually it's not going to be as much or it's going to cover a lot um but that is definitely something to consider knowing how much potassium and phosphorus is in regular milk. Yep. And always just check the labels and maybe they list yep. the phosphorus and potassium. I see it from time to time on some products, mm -hmm. not very often though. So let's talk about some of the plant-based milks, the alternatives, and you mentioned coconut. So let's start there with coconut milk. Yeah. And coconut milk, there's, we kind of got a, split hairs because there's canned coconut milk and then there's like the carton or ready to drink coconut milk. And these two different kinds have two different purposes, similar to the condensed milk versus the carton milk. So the canned coconut milk is traditionally used for recipes for cooking like curries and soups and stews. I think canned coconut milk is wonderful to add into those recipes. Uh, it is higher, much higher in calories compared to the ready to drink milk, but that's because it's used in that baking cooking capacity. So the canned coconut milk has about what, 450, 445 calories for one whole can, um, 48 grams of fat. Now coconut is primarily saturated fat. So it is higher in saturated fat and it, uh, it is heavier in fat. It's lower in protein though, which is fantastic. And for a whole, for a cup of the canned coconut milk, it's 497 milligrams of potassium. We do have a chart for you guys about this. I'm just kind of reading off some of the numbers right now because we're just going through a couple. Um, 217 milligrams of phosphorus, only 40 milligrams of calcium. So if you do need to be careful with your calcium um, intake, and some people do need to be careful of that, uh, the canned coconut milk can be a great option. Now the carton coconut milk or the ready to drink is nowhere near high in calories. It's about 80 or so calories per cup. And it has only one gram of protein, which is also really nice for CKD that needs to be careful of protein, which is a lot of people. Uh, the other thing is only has 90 milligrams of potassium because the carton coconut milk is essentially um, kind of watered down from the canned version of coconut milk. So it's much lower in potassium and it only has 17 milligrams of phosphorus in a cup wow. of the ready to drink. I'm looking at the chart right now. We'll share it with everyone later after we go through these. So you see all these different yeah, types yeah. of milk and the numbers. The difference between canned coconut milk and the ready to drink coconut milk is mm -hmm shocking i mm -hmm. you just mentioned phosphorus from 217 in a can to 17 mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's like one tenth of it yeah of the but phosphorus. again for the, wow. for the canned it's going to be used for like a full recipe i i love and if you want to do if you want to kind of split the difference the light canned coconut milk is a really good option so it has some of the fat removed kind of like two percent milk versus like kind of going between the whole and the skin milk. So the light canned coconut milk, I should have grabbed mine from my pantry. Um, that is a great option. And, and that one I think you can kind of use. And there's actually some of them I think are pretty cool that come in almost like those 
They look like a single serve carton with a little re, uh, the little cap on it, yep. but you can actually reuse it. So it, again, it's good for cooking. So if you want a little bit of a creamier base to your soup, to your stew, for your curry, something like that is really, really great to have on hand. Wow. I, uh, such a difference. I, I, I didn't realize, but you're right. It's you use the can to cook, usually add the whole can into the recipe and a yeah. carton. You're drinking it and putting it back in the fridge. Um, what about almond milk? That's the one I have become mm -hmm. used to. Yeah. Almond milk is, I would say, and this is just my opinion from my experience with plant milks, but I feel like it's one of the earliest plant-based mm -hmm. plant -based milks that, that wasn't soy milk. Almond milk was like the first nut milk that came out, the one that was a soy alternative. Um, this can be a good kidney-friendly option. Like I said, not the best for kidney stones, but in general, almond milk can definitely fit into a kidney-friendly diet. You really want to make sure that you read the label, though, because Again, they can use phosphate additives, even in the refrigerated milks, they can use phosphate additives uh, to be part of their recipe. Like they can add whatever they want. So uh, keep in mind that that is a potential, but it is a low phosphorus milk naturally. And uh, the almond is a nut, is a plant source and doesn't get absorbed as much. I think it's like 40%. Awesome. Yeah. I always love it when it's not a hundred percent. That's why you know, keep an eye yeah. out for those ingredients. Everyone, when you see those chemical versions of phosphorus, mm, that's just a hundred percent. And yeah. being someone who has dealt with kidney stones, I, I think when I'm done with the almond milk, I'm going to mm -hmm. change to something mm -hmm. else because I don't want to risk it. So a few people in the chat have actually mentioned that they like oat milk. What about oat milk? I think oat milk is great. I It's one of the easiest ones to make. I've made it before in the Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook group. I did a live video for that quite a while ago, showed, showed everybody how to make oat, meal, oat milk at home. Super cheap, super easy. But when you're looking at it in the grocery store, I have typically found a lot of the oat milk brands to have phosphate additives. So when I was doing my research and looking for some brands that I would recommend. I was combing through a lot of companies. So I like one of the really popular ones is Oat oh, Yeah. Everyone I found this had additives in that. So that one I have not recommended. If you guys do find it that doesn't have additives, please share it in the Facebook group. Make sure you take a picture of the uh, ingredients list to also prove that it doesn't have the additives. Um, but that one is is definitely tough. There's a brand that I do really like that is Elmhurst and they're a really good milk alternative company. They have a lot of varieties that don't typically have the uh, additives. They have like this barista line that has additives, but just their straight milk options are no additives, very simple. So they have milked oats, they call it. Um, and then there's this other company called Rise Organic Oat Milk that doesn't have additives from what I've seen. But this uh, oat is a great option for a milk. It does have a little bit more uh, phosphorus from the grain. But again, it's a natural phosphorus that's not absorbed nearly as much as the additives. So it's something that is um, still a fraction, literally a fraction of compared to the phosphate additives. And it's lower in calcium for the most part, unless you find something that has calcium added. But anytime they fortify with a mineral like calcium, there's a better chance you're going to have a phosphate additive. Mm -hmm. So how about cashew milk, which kind of, I, I have no clue how much that costs, but I'm thinking it's on the higher end of the uh, mm -hmm. alternative milks. I wish I could tell you if it was or wasn't. It's my favorite kind of milk. To me, it's the creamiest kind. So I really, I really enjoy it. And I use it on sweet my coffee. I, I think uh, Silk, there's you, there's our hit mm -hmm. and miss with additives. So you have to check the labels. I can't say that enough. But the Silk on sweet cashew milk in the refrigerated section that I found does not have phosphate additives. So I'm really happy about that. I like that it's lower in protein, again, more kidney friendly to keep that protein down, except for dialysis, which is a whole different story. 
Um, but the, um, the potassium is also pretty good. The thing about the phosphorus though, is it's really hard to find the milligrams. And I searched, I spent a mm. lot of time in the USDA food database, combing through the different cashew milks, trying to find a phosphorus content, an actual milligram amount for you guys. Couldn't find it. So my rule of thumb goes back to just make sure it doesn't have phosphate additives and you're going to be a lot safer because it's coming from a plant source. So Elmhurst again is a great brand that does not have the additives and uh, the one I use the silk unsweetened cashew milk. Yeah. Now Marilyn asked if you could repeat the brands for the oat oh. milk. You said Elmhurst. Elmhurst and, and Rise. Rise Organic. And I will have links to these uh, for you guys in the in the blog once we get to that point. Um, but you know, if you're looking for something that's just ready and good to go, those are some solid options. Yep. Now, what about what I think of as the first, and you know, it's just what I believe is the first mm -hmm. plant-based milk, soy milk. I remember growing up seeing that before yeah. almond milk. <laughs> yeah, I do. I think soy milk was definitely the original plant-based milk or or alternative to milk. Um, so soy milk, and I I had somebody comment about this on Facebook not too long ago, saying, "Well, I thought soy." was connected to cancer. I thought we couldn't have it. That's not true. That is a myth. And there is no connection that soy causes cancer. Actually, there's more evidence that soy prevents cancer and it's protection against cancer. So it's not something that causes cancer. And then I know and there's another group of people that are worried about soy and hormones, thinking of the estrogen, this this thing that it's soy is going to increase the amount of estrogen in your body and mess up all your hormones and turn you from a boy to a girl and <laughs> all of this stuff. I don't know if you've heard this, James, but I I, I have you know, heard that. Yeah. I, I've heard when you're on the internet, you've heard oh, everything. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So just to cut, just to, to put the record straight. Soy does not do that. It is not the, the quantity of hormones that would be necessary to do any kind of change anywhere related to that would be astronomical. Like you would be eating, you, you wouldn't be able to physically ingest that much soy, soy products, soy milk for that to happen. Um, and honestly, you guys would think if that was the case, the people who do want certain- They would just, um, they'd buy all the certain, soy milk yeah, up. Yeah, exactly, it'd be a lot cheaper. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so let's just clear that kind of stuff out there first. But soy milk can be a part of a kidney friendly diet. Again, it's one that's higher in oxalate. So you want to be careful of it if you have a, a history of kidney stones, calcium oxalate stones. But in general, it is a little bit lower when it comes to the potassium and the phosphorus compared to the uh, cow's milk. And Another thing about soy milk is it's probably one of my favorite milk options for dialysis patients because it still has a higher amount of protein. It still has about that eight grams or no, yeah, six grams of protein per mm -hmm. cup. So it's still up there closer to what cow's milk would provide for that protein, just with less potassium and less phosphorus. And, and soy is an anti-inflammatory for most people. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to have an allergy to soy, which I never knew about mm -hmm. um, until I was diagnosed with kidney disease and we were working on reducing inflammation. And it got to the point where we couldn't figure out, hey, you're still having some, some issues with that. And they discovered... I have an, an allergy to soy. I, I can drink it. I can I, I love edamame, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. I can eat it. I don't notice any problem, but apparently there is within my body. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's great that you found that out because the more you learn about that kind of stuff, the, med the better you can tune in and take care of, of what you need to focus on. Yep. Now, what about rice milk? You mentioned that a little bit earlier. Yeah. So... Okay, soy milk is the first plant milk that came out and then almond milk was there too. I feel like rice milk, maybe it's like my years working in dialysis, that was the go-to milk in dialysis. 
definitely recommended that all the time. It was low in potassium, low in phosphorus, which it is. It is under 100 wow. milligrams of potassium. It's around 100 milligrams of phosphorus per cup. It is very low in protein, though. So it's not in dialysis. It's not providing that extra protein that people need, which I'm not crazy about. But that makes it really good for CKD, having a lot less protein. So this one I think is fantastic, but I want to also say this is another one that people get super confused about because the shelf stable rice milk, which is usually where you find rice milk, there there's a, a brand called Rice Dream, and they have I've seen a, it. they have an enriched and they have a classic, and the enriched means they've added nutrients to it, which means it has. It's going to have phosphorus. It's going to have phosphorus. As a matter of fact, we yes. have a picture of the label. So here is, let me put it up here on the screen, make it bigger. This is the non enriched, which yep. has. So you can see the ingredient list is pretty short. I mean, it's not crazy short compared to if you just made it yourself, but oh it's boy. a pretty short ingredient list. Let me make this in bigger. Yeah, Holy cow. That list, the ingredients is, is and I see. Uh, you guys can't see my mouse. I see phosphate yep. <laughs> right there. Yeah. So the, so the second to bottom line includes tricalcium phosphate. So there is phosphorus. And even this company actually did include the phosphorus in milligrams. So the very bottom line, it's, it has a bold yep. black line. Phosphorus, 150 milligrams in the enriched and only 30 milligrams in the classic. So that classic is going to be your best option when it comes to um, making sure that you don't get those phosphate additives. So very, very important to read the label. Yeah. And we have that chart. Let me bring it up here. Cause we, th this kind of covers the different types that we just discussed. And all this is from the USDA food database mm -hmm. using one cup serving. So they're all kind of normalized using the mm -hmm. same quantity and it actually is, this is very eye-opening to see, you know, the calories, the fat, the potassium, the phosphorus, mm -hmm. um, and the calcium, you know, some of these, the more healthier ones are the ones that look more kidney friendly are lower on calcium, which could be better for kidney stones. Those of us that have them are more likely to get them again. And we can always make up for that by eating some of those other, um, mm -hmm items that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And something again to highlight here is that canned coconut milk is again, significantly higher because it's used in cooking methods. So you use the cup of the canned coconut milk or the full can, and it's gonna add a lot more calories. But I do see this as a potential benefit if you are losing weight and you are not trying to lose weight, just you're losing weight because you're not eating very well with kidney disease, canned coconut milk might be something that Ooh. you can add to get more calories into your body so that you don't keep losing weight. So I think canned coconut milk is a great option. And if you think 497 milligrams, that's still for that all of that 445 calories compared to that skim cow's milk that only gives 80 calories and 411 milligrams of potassium there. So it is uh, just kind of giving you guys some different options. And again, you got to pay attention to what is important to your kidneys, important to your health, because, you know, what James finds that's good for him and his kidneys can be totally different compared to what something that you feel is good for your kidneys. Exactly. We are all unique and it, that, that is 100% accurate. Just because something works good for person A does not mean that's going to be the right thing for person B. Yeah. Now, what about making my own milk? Yeah, it's super, super easy. So again, for one, if you guys aren't in that free Facebook group that for plant powered kidneys, you can go in there. I have a ton of videos. We have even more videos from other people that have shared what they've made as well, but you can comb through those videos and I should probably pull it out from the archives. I told James before we went on live, I said, I want to make a new one, 
but I'm not optimistic with how busy my calendar, how full my calendar is for the week. So I'm, I'm not 100% confident that I can get it done, but I really want to, to make a new video for you guys to put up and share. But really, it's super, super easy. You want to pick whatever base you're using and you want to soak it with filtered water for at least four hours. Usually I just do it overnight. I'll get a mason jar. I take a cup of cashews. I just actually at the grocery store today got some raw cashews. You want to get raw, um, the raw nuts. So a cup of raw cashews, soak them, make sure it's covered, uh, completely saturated in the water. Let them soak at least four hours or overnight or another bonus tip that I, I didn't actually include uh, here, but you could double boil the cashews or the almonds to help pull phosphorus out of them. I'm not sorry, not phosphorus, um, potassium. Phosphorus can come out too, but really the focus is potassium. So you can double boil your cashews to pull out some of that extra stuff and lower the potassium even more if you want it. You don't have to, but if you are really worried about your potassium and it's coming up too high, you could do that extra step. But you basically want to have the uh, whatever it is really, really, really soft because then when you're ready to make the milk, you're gonna drain it, you're gonna add it into your high plow or a good blender along with about four cups of water. You can start with two cups and start blending it and then add a little bit more water to prevent any kind of overflow, depending on the size of your blender. And then you want to filter it either with a cheesecloth or what I just use is my old, um, my kidney or my kidney, my coffee pot. Uh, it has one of those kind of like copper looking reusable, oh, yeah, reusable, yeah, the filters. reusable filters. Yes. Yeah. I use that. And you just, pour it through the filter, you kind of stir because you're gonna start to get basically the grounds, so to say, of whatever it is you're using. And you wanna get that all filtered out so that it's not gonna be collecting in the milk. And you can store it in some jars. Again, I use like old pasta sauce jars or mason jars or a, pitch, a small pitcher if you have it, whatever you like. And that'll keep for like a week or so uh, in your fridge. And it's super, super easy and a lot cheaper, especially if you think about like oats or rice, which is mm -hmm. literally pennies to make something like that. Awesome. So I mean, what it sounds like is I overreacted with pretty much banning almost all milk. And I do use a little bit of almond milk, but even then I'm very hesitant. So it sounds like milk really isn't bad for kidney patients, if we make, we got to look at our labs, mm -hmm. make the right choices between the different options and like everything else, manage the portions, how much of it we right. have. Right, exactly. And it all comes down to, I mean, because again, in some of these cases, the, the right kind of milk that you choose can actually support your kidney health and can really, really help you. So choosing a, a milk that is a little bit higher in calories or finding the milk that's lowest in protein finding the milk that's, that's lowest in potassium, you know, whatever it is that you really want to focus on choosing that milk. If it's something that you include in your recipes, adding to your coffee, adding to your soups, your stews for your cereal, your oatmeal, like so many ways we use milk. So it's better to just make a good decision for yourself and be happy about that decision than it is to um, put it on the no list and just, again, kind of cross out so many recipes. Yep. Now a question we had earlier was creamer, which or I'm, I'm, I'm not a creamer person because I'm not a coffee person. Or, or when so, I did drink coffee, my creamer was caramel. It was a caramel macchiato with extra, extra caramel. Oh, I remember that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, okay. Creamer, that's a whole other subject. Um, I'm a coffee person. I'm not a creamer person. I just, like I said, I just add the cashew milk mm -hmm. to my coffee, but the creamers, the powdered creamers are really, really, uh, risky for phosphorus. The powdered creamers almost always have added phosphates. So if you're getting the kind that you scoop out with your spoon and mix it in, check the label because those ones I advise to be really careful about. Same thing with some of the ones that are in the little cups like the single serve ones like you um, find in a restaurant if they're if the restaurant ones are just like half and half 
it's it's a it's a toss up. It's really hard to tell because again, you might not be able to see all the ingredients. They, I don't mm-hmm. think they include them on the single serve ones. But when you are at the grocery store, if you kind of comb through the different options, I mean, I always recommend if there is one that is your go to that you're already enjoying and this is something that you want to make sure is okay check with that label first and if it's good then great you can stick with that one and you don't have to make any changes but if you do find that the one that you typically reach for has additives that's when you want to spend a little bit more time looking around so then look at another brand like okay well this one also looks good to me so let me take a look or this one's a nice cheaper option let me see if this one's okay so wherever your eyes kind of pull you to just start there and start looking at the ingredients but creamers are notorious for having phosphate additives. The refrigerated section for creamers, I know um, the Natural Bliss line is pretty good with no additives. Um, That's really the only one that's off the top of my head. There are the plant-based creamers, but again, that's another one that you wanna go through and comb through those different brands, comb through the ingredient list in particular to make sure there's no added phosphates. Yeah, and here's I mean, a tip for everybody. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you could probably make your own creamer with the method that I described. Just add less water. So it's a thicker, richer milk. So you could try that too. And then mix in su- sugar, a little vanilla extract, you know, whatever it is, whatever kind of flavoring you want. Yeah, so here's a tip I have. If I don't, if I look at the ingredients and it doesn't have all the information and I can't find it on the website, I reach out to the company's customer service. Either they have a phone number or an email mm-hmm. address. And I would say the majority of the time, they'll give me the information if they have it. Sometimes they have to look for it, but the majority of the time, they will also ask for my address and send me coupons, usually mm-hmm. for free products or half off or, you know, it, it's some, some savings. So it's always yeah. worth reaching out to those companies. And if, you guys know, of course, I tell them all about kidney disease and why it's important to have these things on the label hoping that maybe I might get in the right person's ear and it might make it up the chain. Uh, But it's great to save a little bit of extra money. Yeah, I I think that is such a good idea. And I know a lot of dietitians, I've done it myself, when I've had a client or a patient ask me about a certain food product. And like I say, like I'm combing through all these different resources that I have and I still can't find it. You can reach out to the company, just like James says, that's a great idea. Yeah. And then if you guys want to learn more about milk, more information and, you know, the options for kidney disease, Jen does have a blog post and it's it's live right now. So you can go to her website, plantpoweredkidneys.com and you'll click under resources and blog is the very first option and boom, it pops right out. I also have a mm-hmm. link to it in the description below this video. There's lots more information in there, pictures of labels. I, I love how you, you put the charts. Some of them we've shown here, but I love how the charts are there because it really drives home the differences and the mm-hmm. things that matter to kidney patients between all these milk options. Yeah, hopefully it helps you guys when you can kind of compare everything uh, and, and make a decision that really feels best for you and what you need to focus on. Uh, so now we have one question here. We're almost at the top of the hour, but here's a question. And you, you may not know about this, but having lived in Hawaii, maybe you do know about it. I never would have thought about it because I love macadamia nuts and they are not the most affordable. But what about milk from macadamia nuts? Is that such a thing? Yeah, um, it, there is such a thing. It is a newer milk. I found it at Costco. And actually, I don't know, James, I sent you some pictures I, I had mentioned. Um, oh, is that one I of them? I, I think, I have let me double check. Cashews, almond, uh, no, maybe not. coconut. Oh, is that where uh-huh. you went to get no. these pictures? Unsweetened coconut, rice stream, so, yeah, rice I, I was stream. Telling, I, I told James I went shopping earlier today, and of course I had to stop and read all the labels and take pictures. So I, I just bombarded James with a bunch of pictures of labels that I found. But no, okay, macadamia milk uh, is going to be kind of in the range of, it's a nut, it's high in saturated fat. So think of it like a nut 
closer to the coconut kind of thing. So thinking tropical, but not as high as saturated um, and definitely not as high in calories. But I've had a hard time finding it without added phosphorus, which is why I didn't include it mm. here. I think there is a brand at Costco that doesn't have added phosphates, but I haven't got it. I'm no longer in a um, realistic vicinity of a Costco, so it's not going to be too often that I go. Um, it, in general, I'm going to say in general, I, like all of these, these can all fit depending on your stage. So the same thing with macadamia nut milk, it might be able to fit, but you've got to check the label to number one, make sure it does definitely doesn't have those additives. Awesome. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. I want to thank you so much, Jen, for being here again. And everybody go to plantpoweredkidneys.com. You can get more information at Jen's blog. Make sure you also check out the Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook group. It is the only Facebook group that I go in and interact. All the other ones have pretty much, they drive me nuts when I go in there. There's so much misinformation. Yeah. I just have to run away and leave the other groups. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm so proud of everybody in that group for really sticking to their guns and saying everybody's different and we're not going to be pushing anything in particular on anybody. I'm only going to be talking about evidence based stuff, you guys. So this group and it's going to stay that way. The group I'm very I, I don't want to get too tangential or even emotional about it, but I'm very protective about the group. There's some great founding members in there that including James that um, I keep an eye out on things and will tell me if anything is going on that I'm not seeing. Um, but really it's such a good group and everyone's very supportive and they know, uh, you guys know that everybody's different and we can't say how, we can't say what works for one person will absolutely work for another unless it's scientifically proven. And, um, if that's the case and you're going to find a lot more information about it readily available online. Yep. All right, everybody. I will see you in the next video. Bye everyone.